you know, I got to a certain age, got to about 50 years old ago, I'm going to simplify my life. So I started selling off my interests and, and selling off some businesses. And I kept on getting pulled into, Hey, I'm having problems with my business. Can you come help me? And so, you know, uh, I got called uh, to a company. They were the largest NEC phone systems dealer in the Southeast United States. And they were struggling because they were going from one technology to another technology. And, you know, from the traditional NEC phone system that you have on the desk to a voice over IP, uh, something like Ring Central. And again, these guys were on the bleeding edge, but they did not have the technical know how on what they need to do to ensure the quality of the call would always go through and the call would not be dropped. And so I went in there. In a Goldilocks, how to get it just right. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode, another conversation with another amazing human who is going to help you get your business just right. A lot of times people get into business with a purpose, with a mission, with a passion. But it's not always that all the tools and the process is laid out to make sure all the elements are addressed just right. And the oversight of bypassing that step, those necessary benchmarks and measurements and tools can lead to problems. So today you are gonna be excited to be hearing from and learning from Paul Tegel, who's gonna be joining us to help us get business just right. Paul, welcome to Unleash Shana Goldilocks. Well, thank you very much for having me. As we get started, let's take a moment and talk a little bit of your background. What do you do and why do you do what you do so that people can start understanding what that means to them in their business and getting their business just right? Wow, that's a loaded question. Uh, but, you know, what I do... Uh, is I I get excited to build and scale organizations. And ultimately, uh, these organizations support people uh, and livelihoods and stuff like that. It, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm really good. Uh, my, me personally, I'm very good in the technical space, uh, whether uh, IT service providers, uh, uh, whether it be distributors of IT service and, and products like Dell and stuff. Um, I help throughout the channel. I try to help develop a consistent manner in which, you know, an IT service provider or distributor distributes their message throughout their, throughout the in, entire ecosystem of delivering the final ends and products to their customers, um, you know, setting expectations throughout. And um, that's where a lot of businesses fail is not setting the right expectations at the different levels of distribution, um, no matter what they're doing, whether they're, you know, even a hairdresser or, you know, Paul Mitchell with their, with their products and services and deliveries. Um, but, you know, it's, again, I specialize in, in, the, in the tech space and done stuff in the medical space, uh, with, uh, hemologics, um, uh, durable medical pieces of equipment. And so my experience is pretty broad and, and, and wide. Um, you know, I started off in college uh, as a computer science major, and I happened to be the student of the Dean of Computer Science. 
uh, where at that point I was a I was a first student representative for the college that I went to, was Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. To, and I started up the student lab and the faculty lab, and I was the IBM representative for that. And while I was doing that, I got contracts, uh, national contracts for programming for companies like Blockbuster and 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 regional power uh, organizations. And my livelihood at that point was I'd work three days a week and then spend four days a week on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> I go, I, I started, I started to overspend or come close to overspending by only working three days a week. So I go, well, what do I have to do? Now I got to scale my organization. Now, what am I going now? I'm going to start supplying hardware along with the software and picked up additional contracts. And I was the main, the main programmer for the first five years um, and um, I, I built that company, built uh, bytes, bits, and megabytes. Uh, and while I was building that company, I, uh, I built it by uh, creating our own products and services that we resold through other organizations like ours uh, to customers. And um, I did it through mergers and acquisitions. And at the time, I didn't know what to name this stuff. So it's mergers and acquisitions, I div divestitures of organizations that I had that I bought that had five different divisions. I only was interested in the first two and divested the other three. So talk to us a little bit about what does Biz Advisory Services uh, do and how people can engage you through that process in terms of Say I am a technology company that's delivering strategy and services versus I'm a technology company with a product because you have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, products in the technology industry are going basically by the wayside. They're an, a necessary type of product that you need to provide to be able to support the client uh, because their existing hardware is not specifically designed to take to, to, to do what needs to be done. Like look at CloudStrike, you know, look at the issues that they had and they have to have a, a piece of equipment on site, but, but it's all driven by software um, and, and everything else that they need. So, you know, uh, we, we take a look at probably about four opportunities a week and we only accept about two to three a month. Um, you know, we take a look at the team, uh, we take a look at the product, uh, you know, we take a look to, to, to see if the, if there's something similar product out there in the market and, and, and see where they're properly, see where they're positioned. And then, you know, the whole idea is if they have an A team and a B product, that's the way we like to have it, where, you know, a lot of people have an A product, the product's great, but the team to drive it is is not good. And a lot of times what we'll do is, you know, we got two of them coming up right now and they understand that, you know, their product's great, but their team to bring it out is not good. And that's where we help subsidize in that team, um, whether it's, it, it's in marketing, uh, in, in, in evaluation, uh, um, you know, putting a CEO or a chief technology officer or chief financial officer, helping them identify what they need. Now, you know, that's what we're really good at is helping identify what they need to, to accelerate their growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, uh, doctor, we're, you know, we're, we're good at a few things, but we have a vast network of other fractional people out there that will work on a part-time basis they have experience specifically with that product or market or whatever they're trying to put out. And so we kind of act like a matchmaker because one thing we can't do is try to do something that we're not good at. You know, first of all, it consumes too much of our time because we're trying to learn it and trying to do it and everything else rather than finding someone that has expertise in order to get it done and get it done quickly. Uh, you know, my history, you know, my LinkedIn and everything else. The last Thursday of every month is a day that we fire clients. And we fire them because they're not 
holding up their end of the bargain because we have a vested interest in them and they have a vested interest in us. And the thing is, is if they're not holding up their end of the bargain, their workload and, and everything else that's necessary, or they don't necessarily follow the advice that we say, you have to do this or, you know, this is negotiable because whatever, if they, if they don't do that, then we let them go because we have others that are hungry and anxious to work with people that are deliberate and on task and on time. The same type of things that all of our customers ask for. You're deliberate on task and on time. And you set that expectation up front. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad the boundaries are set, rules of engagement are established, and everybody knows where we're going, how we're going, and when we are getting there and what the milestones are. Because that's the mm -hmm. only way the journey is plausible. Otherwise, then somebody is holding the bag and the other is blaming the person holding the bag. So I'm mm -hmm. glad you have that the psychology and the output and the performance, all of it linked. What's coming up for me as I'm talking to you is selling services is a little bit different than selling products. And a lot of people who serve in the IT services space struggle with or always tap it about how much can I charge? How much can I mark up? How much profits are reasonable? And how do I craft a solid SOW, mm -hmm. statement of work, to address what's at hand and manage the scope without allowing scope creep to kind of push things in the wrong direction, but then incrementally assist the organization in other arenas, but start in a focused area in a very targeted strategic fashion. What advice would you have for businesses that are tech services oriented in that arena? I don't think it's just tech services only. I think it's everything you need. What I typically do is we do a market study and a market study is going to help establish the price. It's going to help establish a story and everything else. And typically what we do is, is you put together uh, a sheet, an Excel sheet, and across the top is like, you know, your competitors, their strong points and weak points and, and, and everything else. So something similar is, is if you're doing a comparison of products on Amazon, go, I want to compare this product against this product against this product. And, you know, it's not always the price that wins. You know, it might be the number of customer reviews. It might be, oh, you know, these guys are doing something a little bit different, but you have to identify what makes you special and what makes you different. And then you go about, okay, what kind of price can I charge for this? And then you go back, once you got the price that we can charge, and a lot of organizations, when they're first starting off, <laughs> don't know, they have an idea on how much they charge, but they don't know how much it is to actually get it to that point to distribution. And they don't understand that distribution, the R&D, uh, the, the licenses, everything else that's necessary to get to the point. And they need to understand that distribution, if they bought, needs to make hundred, roughly 100% markup on what you're selling to them. So basically I'm selling them a widget or I'm selling them a service, whatever it is, I sell it for $50 and they need to be able to market it at $100 and be competitive on the market. Now at that $50 rate, I need to make sure that I can at least squeak out 30% profit. You know, if I can't do it now, I need to do it in the near future. Because a lot of times when, when someone develops a product, they uh, the first products they develop, they got to pay for molds and they got to pay for a whole bunch of stuff that they do the first time. And, you know, the first thousand units of whatever they make, they, they may not make that 30%. They might make 5%. But the next thousand, they're going to make 10%. The next thousand, they're going to make 15% and finally work up their uh, their production. And, and whether you're talking about parts and pieces to make hardware or uh, 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 software uh, portions to make up an entire software platform, it's all about the same. You know, there's a bunch of R&D initially to, to get the thing launched, but you got you got to expense the R&D over selling 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 licenses. 
And you got to under, and so, you know, depending on what industry you're talking about, you need to be able to do that. It's amazing how, um, you know, I had a, a guy that has a, a ball. And this ball, when you hit it with a bat, would glow. When you hit it, it would, it would, it would, it would blink red, green, or blue. And basically it was used for, it's used for training in baseball, uh, in sports like cricket. And so the whole idea is, you know, you swing for the ball and you're supposed to keep your eye on the ball. And when you swing, then you tell the coach what color that ball was. And that's why the coach knows that you're keeping your eye on the ball. And so, but this guy, this guy, his manufacturing was done in China. Uh, he was using all the best parts uh, and it was very labor intensive. And he was selling it on Amazon for $50. But it was costing him $42 to make it and have it land. And the thing is, is there wasn't enough margin. And, for, and then he was also paying shipping. And so he's coming really close. It cost him $50 just for the product. Forget the, all the R&D and everything else that went into it. And selling it for roughly the same amount of money. And uh, he didn't want to raise it. He was, for every ball that he sold, cost him money. Well, needless to say, he's no longer around. He had his heart in the business. You know, uh, anytime he got money for something, uh, he mortgaged his house. Uh, he would get uh, money back from the IRS. Um, with taxes, he'd take all that money and put it back into it. It was it was it was something that he loved so much, and but he needed a CEO, mm -hmm. and he needed a, a chief financial officer to say you can't run your business on that. He needed to make and land the balls and sell the balls at twenty five dollars. Then he can sell for and then then he can sell for fifty and have enough money to pay back some of the R and D and and all that other kind of fun stuff that's necessary. But mm -hmm. whether you're talking product or software. You know, you, with software, a lot of times you're paying for a lot of people uh, in, in your back offices to, to develop and, and yeah. you're running KPIs and everything else necessary. It, it's all about the same type of methodology. It's just how you apply it in the different industries and the organization that you select uh, to help you through this needs to have something that's really exact or something that's really, really close that's directly relatable. So the the learning um, the, the, the learning uh, differential is really not that big. It's music to my ears as a finance professional. A lot of people don't think of their time, their effort, what it takes to keep the lights on. All of that is cost. And if we don't cover all our cost and we are in, we're playing in that profit region, we're technically hobbyists, right? We are not running a business. We're pursuing a hobby, a passion project. So I'm so glad to hear you say this. Before I open it up to our live audience for questions, Paul, how can folks get a hold of you to talk to you, to engage you, and maybe even seek your uh, business's assistance, both on the advisory side and on the um, uh, business growth side? Um, well, my information is, 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 is right here. Right here at the bottom, Paul Daigle at bizadvisoryboard.com. And there's my phone number. And the website is bizadvisoryboard.com. Uh, I'm I publish a lot on LinkedIn uh and uh, uh, so, some other social media. But I publish a lot there about mergers and acquisitions, strategy, uh, all that different type of stuff that I kind of uh, alluded to today. So see me on LinkedIn. Paul Daigle, Biz Advisory Board. Thank you so much, Paul. And I am going to see what questions our live audience have. Go ahead, Dr. Nandini. Hi. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Kuss. You know, uh, you started your introduction about people having purpose, ideas, and passion, and then the process being missing and scary. Uh, and um, Mr. Daigle, ended with the same thing about people having a hobby and not knowing how to 
make that sustainable. And mm-hmm. I'm wondering uh, about, my question is about that because most professionals like me, you know, we have passion, we have ideas, we have purpose. And we're in that transition phase and we we have these little hobbies on the side that we're trying to figure out, is it worthy? Is it, you know, is it sustainable? And do you have maybe one or two tips for somebody in my position where we're kind of transitioning between <clears throat> professions or trying to complement our current profession with something completely different as a hobby and wondering when and how we know? Well, uh, very good question. Uh, I kind of alluded to it before, you know, it's the process is similar in every organization and it shouldn't be, it should not be missing and it should not be scary. Uh, uh, you should be excited about it and, 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 you know, push your way through. But, you know, my recommendation to you is to take a look at at what your hobby is and find other people that have taken your hobby and are doing it professionally and then scale it back from there. Okay. What they're doing professionally and then what make then, then how you, if you go in, if you go into the market and we haven't decided yet, if you go into the market, can you make enough money? Can you make yourself different from everybody else? And, you know, you put together a chart, a comparison chart, you know, what, what, uh, what they all do. And once you understand whatever you're doing in that hobby, whatever they do, you you can find things to help build your scope and your roadmap of services that you need to do. You can identify the gaps in what they're offering. If you're an expert at it and you're a hobbyist at it, you have the desire define what they're missing and include it into what you're doing and to make and and to use that as, you know, they do it this way. We do it this way. And these are the reasons why. And then find someone to practice on and, um, and and improve your methods. And as you build your logos and as you build the the people that, that you're doing your hobby to, I'm trying not to say what your what the hobby is. It doesn't much matter. I, I just want to keep yeah. it generic. Sure. <laughs> but when, once you can prove that, you know, you have your products and services, one thing that you should avoid doing is offering at a discount, especially at first. You know, identify what you're doing. And the first time you go through, it's going to take you two, three times the amount of time it will be when you get up to the 10th time you do it. But don't be the cheapest, and you could be right up there with the most expensive. And if you're really good, if you really did your research, you can charge 5% more. And then see if you can make a business out of it, scale the business, fill in. You know, you're doing it first as a hobbyist, and then fill fill in the, the stuff that you're typically not good at. My screen locked up a little bit, guys. Yeah. Do you want to repeat the last part? I can edit it out, Paul. Okay. No, it was so good. <laughs> but I hate that way to show room four. But basically, uh, you know, Research, what when you do your research, you're able to go through and identify areas in which and it's not happening very well. I seem to be locking up. Let me close some applications here, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, you, you kind of, I don't know if it's me, I don't know what it is, but I'm going to eliminate me as an issue. Yeah, it's your bandwidth, I think. Okay, yeah, I've 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 just closed all kinds of stuff. And okay. I, I don't have it. But things that see me very well. I see me moving. Something happened with her. 
fantasy. Hold on. Sometimes it's your provider, not even you. Bandwidth <laughs> yeah, fluctuates, right? I examine myself first before I place issue someone else. And so maybe we could try it again. Yes, go ahead. It's not going so well. But <laughs> you know, you be okay. You be obvious. You need to see what your competition's doing. You need to chart out what competition's doing. And you need to find gaps into what they're doing and see if you can fill those gaps. The more of those gaps that you fill, the more things that make you unique and different from everybody else. And when it comes to pricing on your first few, don't, you, your pricing, you, you probably want to charge about 80, 90% of, of what the competition's charging or what you want to charge. But, but, you know, as you, as you, as you get five or six of those clients, you're going to want to charge, you know, that hundred percent. And if you're really good, you charge an extra 5% on top of the percent of what they're charging um, to make you different because there's a perceived value and any products or services, if you're the cheapest, you know, when's, what's the last, when's the last time you bought the best car in the car lot? You know, you typically don't do that. And so, you know, in, you might not be buying the most expensive, but the thing is, is the credibility in everything you have to offer and your, and your product or service, whatever you're trying to offer. Uh, again, you got to be different. And you're going to be offering and, and pointing out things that the other other guys aren't doing as part of one of the things that you are doing. So you just have to position it by research. Um, and, and there's a there's a there's a term for that, but uh, I forget what it is. But it's just investigating what the market's doing and positioning yourself to be different and better than what they have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I love the question, Nandini. It's something that we continue to explore for a lot of our audience, right? So thank you for asking the question and appreciate your response, Paul. Very comprehensive. Go ahead, Robin. All righty. What an amazing conversation. And I kind of tend to go toward the human side of business. And as I was listening to you at the beginning, talking about having to come in, and totally switch over someone to a different system and then being, you know, kind of on the cutting edge cusp of the computer science emerging. So when you go into organizations and you're trying to help them do all this new stuff and, and especially stuff that's, <laughs> that has to do with technology, any kind of technology that can be extremely frustrating to people and also just making organizational changes. There's all kinds of politics power politics in within the changes how do you how do you deal with those and how do you help the people that you work with work through that frustration and be able to kind of massage the politics in an organization so they can actually function better all right robin that's a really good question and and i think the whole key is to baseline where they are now in the baseline where they are, not only on the financials, but even on the people side, uh, which you got to go the people side. You know, you, a lot of times I won't go into and turn around an organization without doing a Myers Briggs or without doing a disc profile because that provides me the information that I need to be able to position that particular person and to be able to talk to them in the way they need to be talked to that they they understand and what i do is i share my profile with them also i'm gonna go i'm a high d uh and and someone come to me uh and you got a problem you know come to me you got a problem give me three choices and if i need to do any other discussion i'll discuss it but I need to care the problem and move on <laughs> um you know i'm i'm a i'm a rip and replace 
Uh, I find that if I go into an organization uh, to turn them around, I'm a rip and replace. If there's someone that does not belong, and it's typically, it's not a bad product, it's not a bad service, but there's one or two people within the organization that are keeping it from being able to grow and scale. I go and identify those guys and I work with those guys. I KPI them. I they we develop the KPIs for them on a weekly basis, three weeks in a row. Typically, if they're not keeping up with what they've agreed to do and the KPIs and, and their the expectations that I'm ex that we're both expecting the following week, meet with them on Friday. Another week we revise it again, another week goes by. And by the third week, most of the time, they stop showing up for work because they realize they're not a good mix for the organization. And that takes a lot of trust from the stake owners because a lot of these owners, a lot of these owners are private equity companies. A lot of them might be a silent owner go, I'm not getting, I'm not getting the benefit. I'm not getting the results. I'm not getting money. I'm not getting all this stuff that I'm expecting when I invested the money I did in this company. Uh, you know, when I come from a financial institution, you know, they're starting to have a hard time paying their, their, their mortgage, or they might be having a hard time paying off their credit line and, and doing different types of things. That's just different reasons that you send somebody like me into an organization uh, because the, the organization is not meeting expectations. And so it's a, you got, you got to baseline it. And you got to find and, and you got to identify the people and help make sure the people are in the right places, because I don't want to be. You know, I don't want to be letting someone go. Uh, if they're not the right person, you know, a lot of times, you know, when it comes to an accountant. I might bring in a, a fractional or part time chief, chief financial officer to kind of shore up the books. Again, that's all part of the baseline. Uh, you know, we get compensated not only for the hours we spend, but for the advancements that we make in sales and production uh, uh, and in in, in, in in finances. And so when we're properly baseline that and, and we get the OK from the, from the people who have the stake in the organization, it goes it goes fairly quick the, the people side is the thing that really holds holds us back more than anybody else more than anything else but once you get that dialed in and it's never being that you might be dialed in today uh it gets out of dial <laughs> it gets into chaos and so a uh, type thing on, on on a regular basis uh to make sure to to do a check to make sure that people are staying on track and people still love their job you know, I don't want to have somebody that doesn't love their job. Someone that loves their job will be able to do it in a shorter amount of time and be able to pick up other projects and help scale and grow the organization. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're very Thank welcome, you. Robin. Thank you for always bringing that people forward question, Robin. Love how you address that, Paul. As it's amazing time flies when we are having fun and we're having a insightful conversation as we bring this to a close, if there was a nugget of advice you have for businesses, what would that be? Help us share that as we come off the air. I think the one piece of advice is, you know, you have tennis players and tennis players have a coach. You have boxers, boxers have a coach. You have uh, pickleball. Pickleball professional players have coach. A business and any type of business should have a coach. That for the same is reasons. Well said. <laughs> that is well said. Thank you so much, Paul. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Appreciate the insight. I know our community is going to definitely benefit from it. And I know as we release this across social media, a lot of people are going to tune in and they know how to get a hold of you. So we appreciate mm -hmm. your time, your insights, and let's keep building on this. And for our audience out there, whatever it is you're doing, make sure you're doing it in a way 
that you're getting the benefits of it. It is benefiting and driving the ultimate purpose in a sustainable way because anything that is not sustainable cannot be kept up and therefore the impact you're making is going to be very short-lived. So it behooves you to go get the right coach and do things the right way so that the things you're doing are going to continue to make this world a better place. Thank you.